Welcome to the OER by Domains 21 morning after episode. And uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> seven, eight days. <laughs> Stick with me here. And uh, so what we have here is we have the group that worked on kind of near and dear element of the conference for me personally. OER by Domains 21 was a conference. It ran April 21st and 22nd. And the idea of this session is to kind of do a reflection and debrief on the development of the headless conference schedule site um, for uh, OER by Domains 21 that was actually taking on the conceit of a 1980s, we'll argue, um, TV guide. So welcome, Tom Woodward. Welcome, Michael Branson Smith. Welcome, Tim Owens. And welcome, Lauren Hanks, to this Reclaim Today episode, wherein we debrief about the OER by the Men's 21 <laughs> conference. Like and subscribe <laughs> or more. <laughs> All right. So anyway, um, where do we go from there? I mean, that's kind of the video. <laughs> that was the uh, plan. Play the outro. <laughs> OK, so. I guess it would probably be good to start with why this is the route we took, maybe. Um, what led us to kind of thinking about this? And Jim, Tim, I'm not sure if you all were. Um, I've, been thinking, I've been thinking about this, actually. And this is actually probably the only thing I've done for the site. So it's worth me starting and then shutting up. I was back in Fredericksburg, we had kind of started talking about OER by Domains 21 and working with the great folks at all to put on this conference as an online conference. And we were talking with Brian Mathers because he's done art for both Reclaim Hosting and for OER. So we were like, we're gonna work with Brian Mathers and we're gonna get some of the visuals that we kind of know and love. And the idea as I was working with Tim and Reclaim Arcade, I was playing with the laser discs and I was seeing some of those like bumpers before the laser discs that would be like, boo, selective or boo, laser disc. And it was like, boom, boom, boom. And they'd come in and that would be it. And then the movie would start. And I think we started chatting a little bit about we're going to use TV as the aesthetic. And it would be really cool to have some of these visual animated bumpers. And so that's kind of the first part of the discussion with Brian Mathers that ultimately I think led us to rethinking how we presented that more generally on the web. Does that make sense in terms of the early thinking, Tim and Lauren? Yeah, I think, you know, we were trying to navigate how to, I don't know, gracefully combine two different conferences, right? And you had these two natural tracks, but then we knew that OER was definitely going to have at least two tracks within their kind of umbrella as well. And so it wasn't a far jump to go from tracks to channels, you know, and thinking about each track being its own channel and each presentation being its own episode, you know, and the I think that guide, just the TV guide idea sort of snowballed on each other, but. Uh, yeah, and we had, we had taken a lot of, um a lot of inspiration from a digital oceans conference last fall as well. Yeah. Um, they had, they had been using Streamyard, and they kind of done the model where you would pre-record stuff and then the presenters could be in discord and communicate mm -hmm. with the, with the audience, so to speak, while the presentation was happening. And we were like, that's a really interesting model, but even more so than that was the way they presented it was a single player where videos kept going through and there was, uh, there was little breaks between them and they would go on to the next one. And we thought, well, this is kind of a compelling way to view it. So I think the, the mashing up of like the more practical idea of having the archive, having StreamYard, Discord back channels, along with that idea mm -hmm. of the TV aesthetic um, was something really compelling for us. And we thought, what if we put that all together into some sort of like retro television aesthetic with a guide, with all that kind of stuff. And it just kind of snowballed from there. And I think one of the things that happened is we were on a call with Alt, who runs the OER conference. And they were like, we've had some issues with our website, um, you know, and there have been some kind of questions around WordPress. And I don't even think the TV guide element came up until we talked right. with Tom and, and Mike or Michael. 
But I do think that we were like, uh-oh, WordPress issues with sites, a lot of traffic. We're a hosting company. We're going to look like hell if this goes wrong. So what we did actually is we basically um, thought almost Tim and I at the same moment were like, wow, remember that headless stuff Tom Woodward was showing us at VCU? And we had already worked with Michael Branson Smith on actually developing a website for Reclaim Video. So I think it was at that point, and Tim had to step away for a second, but that's at that point I turned to Tim and Lauren and I was like, we should try headless. And Tim was saying to me at the time, but there's only six weeks to the conference. What are you talking about? And I think at that point uh, we reached out uh, to Michael Branson Smith and Tom Woodward to see what was possible in such a short period of time. So it might be worth um, introducing you two and the work you have done previously with headless and web design and how that came when you heard us. What were you thinking? Did you think it was possible? Do you think we were out of our mind? Like, I'd be very interested to get a sense of where you were at. Well, on my end, um Getting the data out, honestly, at this point is is not that hard, and and we can do it pretty fast and and build the the backends pretty fluidly. So like like in the midst of this, we may have had six weeks, but I think really we had a conversation, and then there was a big gap of time, and then you know what I mean. So it was hmm, not quite six weeks in in my my feel, um, and some of it was just like to me the hardest part is like how did alt do it before you know what do we actually want to happen are we going to automate like getting from their other system into this system like that stuff was more complex honestly than getting the data out because wordpress's default um json endpoints are pretty good now and with advanced custom fields, we can build like some pretty friendly data entry structures. And as we proved during this thing, change them frequently um, at the last minute, <laughs> um, which we did a lot of as we discovered we needed more channels or more this or more that. Um, so my end really was was pretty simple. And, f you know, it's, it's just an amazingly powerful way to structure data input and to get it out and then michael had to do the hard stuff which is visualize interact with and construct so like <laughs> my end was pretty easy before we get to michael and we will i'd ask you tom could you like if you were to be asked put on the spot which i'm about to like what headless is and how you yeah. structure data using you know APIs and JSON and the whole discussion of cores came up, which I have no idea what it is. Like, what is some of that stuff? And why would we even want to do it this way? Like, I think I kind of skipped over that. So could you help me here, please? please? I mean, maybe. Like, yeah, and, and, and some real technical people will probably be like, this guy's a moron. In which case, like, send me a letter and educate me or, or something, <laughs> you know? But I mean, like, in, in my head, it's like this. Like, when you go to WordPress normally, even with caching and stuff, like often there are queries to the database. If you have a whole bunch of people all at once going to WordPress, that's noisy. It eats up processor stuff. If you have lots of people writing to WordPress, it sure as hell does that, uh, as we've proven time and time again, as we've crashed things. Um, and so, and you know, caching and all that stuff helps, but still like WordPress is just like, it's not that efficient with it. It's not that super fast with it. If you can have something that's easier to cache and give out, um, like a big chunk of structured data, JSON in this case, um, then you can do really cool stuff like Michael's done, which is just write this whole kind of JavaScript interface to the data. And so headless is essentially creating the data that just kind of like hangs out there. It's super easy to cache. There's no database query involved. It's just like, there it is. The, the website itself can just kind of build itself really quickly based on user interactions and whatnot. And um, it's just, it's fast, it's low impact on the server. Um, and you have the flexibility to kind of do anything you want because you're not 
trying to wrap it inside of WordPress. So we just wor use WordPress to write because people are familiar with it. It's an easy place to build the writing interface. And then the reading construction thing is done by Michael. And I think that was super appealing, especially in the beginning. And also because we were working with the alt team and, you know, there were so many hands on deck, so many people that were adding in content. And this year in particular, I think, um, you know, the alt team was using a new registration site and there was just a lot of newness. And so it felt overwhelming this idea of bringing in a whole other platform for the conference site also. So the fact that we were able to say, it's just a WordPress dashboard, we can customize the fields, you know, so any data that you all want to collect, uh, email addresses, Twitter usernames, all that stuff, you know, we can have a place for it that not only becomes, you know, that space for uh, displaying and delivering content during the actual site, but then it's also a nice archive of who was participating in this specific event. So um, it was a really easy sell on our end also when we were coordinating with the other teams and the other players that were ultimately the ones interacting with the WordPress dashboard and adding in the content. And it was trippy to have two servers, like the WordPress site on one server and then the actual HTML that, and Michael never really had to jump on the WordPress server. It's so like Tom did his work here, Michael did his work here, and the two never would meet. And that was kind of interesting, both of them sitting there. And to your point, uh, Tom, we had no traffic issues at all with the website. Like it was just, um, we didn't even have to think about it for that two and a half days, which was beautiful. And that in and of itself makes it worth it because you know <laughs> the first thing you think in running a virtual conference and I've, you know, I've been a participant in other virtual conferences where the sites just crash and then everybody's just wow. sort of out of luck. And that just wasn't an option. You know, it, it had to work. It had to be online the whole time. So, well, the um, one thing we didn't hit was what Jim is kind of pointing out now. Since we had it on two different servers, cores comes into play, which is essentially can this thing over here be allowed to access the data over here in a particular way? And when you're dealing with JavaScript because of like cross site scripting and, and all sorts of hacky type things. Um, you kind of have to explicitly grant the permission. Um, and so we had a little bit of bump uh, around that. And I did it in like three different ways. <laughs> I think Tim did it in another way. So I'm not sure in the end which one actually worked, but it, <laughs> it's not too bad once you turn it on, then it just works. Uh, you're muted, Tim. I thought somebody was producing this. I really thought that somebody would be <laughs> muting and unmuting for me. Golly, you know, can't catch a break here. <laughs> um, no, I think that's a good point. And, you know, I tried some HT access rules. And then the other weird thing, it kind of gets into. Oh, uh -oh now he's gone. <laughs> Unbelievable. He is not meant to. There we go. <laughs> this is, you know. When you, you give people power, and this is what happens. It's a very dangerous, slippery road that I've been on. <laughs> I wonder if you guys can guess who's producing evil. <laughs> evil stuff. Um, no, but... Watch yeah. out, networks. Jim is just the man on the switch. That's right. Exactly. This is the man behind the curtain. Um you know, it gets into the weeds, but we even found like, we just wanted to like wild card, like, yeah, any website can access this because we're not too concerned about security. And then Safari was like, yeah, we don't respect that rule. <laughs> like we're not gonna, you know, it's always like just for that browser, it wouldn't even allow a wild card. Like you had to specify each domain. And so, yeah, just weird, weird stuff like that to work through. Yeah, cause that's one part where I heard you all talking about cores and I was like, wow. I have no, I have like, what is that? And I <laughs> didn't take the time or really have the interest to find out, to be clear. But that was a point where I was like, that's, that's cool. Because I was just watching from after we had the idea, I was kind of watching you all work, right? Like, that was kind of a beautiful thing to see. You know, obviously, we've worked with Tom and Michael before in different projects. And DS106 is always a common thread. 
But the fact that you all just took the assignment, you know, you chose to take it and you kind of nailed it. You know, I mean, I think, Michael, we didn't talk specifically about the development process, but it would be interesting to hear, you know, you were brave enough to take this thing on, on top of your day job. Uh, why? Well, because I, I ignored my day job for a good two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Something when I get up for class, <laughs> uh, and also uh, it also forced me to stop working on my my duck hunt uh, uh, rebuild. But uh, <laughs> but uh, I think I think the the thing is like I um I kind of approach it the way that one of those people who's watched a few too many uh, home improvement videos and YouTube videos and says like I think I could redo the plumbing in my bathroom. <laughs> you know, I, I think I could do that now. I've got some tools. I've got a, I've got okay skills, you know, which leads to just yeah. you just approach it like part by part, and you're like, wow, okay, I actually have to pull the the sink out, you know, now, and and I was sure I knew how to put off the plumbing, but man, now there's a big hole in the wall that I wasn't expecting to have to rebuild, and so I think a lot of this was to a certain extent like this, it's like, I approach it as like one problem at a time. The first one I was most scared of was how was I gonna build the player, right? Because the player was gonna be this, you know, tool that smartly responded to whether the presentation was live or pre-recorded. And, and we wanted to embed the chat, the live YouTube chat versus the Discord uh, chat, which the only way to embed it out there was this uh, group uh, called Titan that had built like basically a beta. And the way I looked at it, ultimately I, look, I realized is they were, Titan is a Discord server and all our Discord uh, feeds were going through their server to allow us to do this. And they had just built the embed tools for, for they made a connection with their API to that stuff in particular. So that was cool and making edits. And so you're just like tinkering and tinkering and tinkering. And so that was, pretty satisfying, but ultimately the most satisfying was when we started to finally work on the listing pages. Like the, the, the player mm -hmm. itself was, had a certain amount of problems um, that I can speak about specifically, but the listings pages is where it was really interacting with Tom's data. And there's a lot of cool stuff that's possible once you start working with, um, you build a design. So the design, I, as you remember, I just would, I mean, the cool thing about the TV guide and the way I was thinking about it is like a TV guide, an old TV guide was this paper page flipper that would display, you know, dozens of channels and hundreds of television shows across like five pages. Like if you think about it, it'd be, and so a, pre, a conference like this, in a sense, wasn't unlike that, but they're so economical with that presentation of data, right? So they give you the bare minimum uh, bit of detail in the beginning. And so then you'd go watch the show and see if you liked it. And so the cool thing is with us is we could give this title and the speakers and maybe a bare minimum of detail and that was it. And you could see the, with CSS, you literally can chunk off and you get the dot, the ellipses, the dot, dot, dot. That's actually done with CSS. You don't, the, the full, the full text is there in the HTML. The CSS is just not allowing you to see it. All right. <laughs> and so, you would just, but the cool thing is then, since it's the web and you know pages are free, you would just click on it and you get this pop-up window and you get to see the full um, presentation information, right? And as well as the link to the watch button. And so that was really satisfying way to allow someone to, you know, preview all of this data very quickly about all the presentations and say recognize like a speaker by name or portions of a title that was interesting to them or even track the different channels. It's like, oh, that Jim Groom guy, I'm avoiding him. I'm just going to look at the OER one and OER two channels. Like, cause I, oh, he snuck in on that one. Damn it. So he just kept showing up here and there. But for the most part, if you wanted to avoid him, you just go to OER, channel OER one and channel OER two. <laughs> and I think so, there's also, yeah, I'll, I'll say, 
you know, as part of this design that we really didn't get into, but it had the ability to do. We just, for, for part, for time, but also I think just for part, for interest, like if we had wanted a speaker page, that would have been negligible to add, right? Because all the data, Tom, I, correct right. me if I'm wrong, all the data was in the WordPress site. They were added as speakers anyway. So mm -hmm. I know like Sked, Dot com is a very popular sort of online scheduler for conferences. And there's a lot of those things where it's like, show me all the presentations that Jim's on or show me a speaker list with all of the various presenters in it. And then, you know, or, or all of them on this particular track or all of them on this tag, there would have been ways where if we had wanted to filter the TV guide, we right. could have, if we wanted yep. to in the future, say only show me the domains track stuff or only right. show me stuff from these presenters. And we could have done things like that too. the data itself i think um, becomes really malleable in that in that context and, yeah you're right we definitely there was a lot of filtering that was i mean there's a i mean it's definitely one of my things that i think is a lot of fun to play with is like once you have all this data that has attributes that you can interact with then you can start to write all of these methods to sort it and filter it mm -hmm. right um you know and so for this one the biggest filter tool was time right and right. so that was my, I think, favorite part about it was the idea that you you entered as a you know user of the WordPress site that that Tom built, and you had to enter a date, and it was one of the two dates, the 21st or the 22nd, and then a specific time. And since the the conference was hosted by um, Alt, and they're in London, all the initial scheduling time was based on London time, which is uh, uh, British summer time, right? And so the cool thing is you take that time and then there, you use a library that like I use called Luxon and you would pick that time, assign that time to Luxon to British time, but then it's a universal time. It's literally a time that exists in a moment on the planet and it will never come back and it'll never come be there again. It's an exact amount of time. And then with Luxon's library, you could do all sorts of interesting things. Like you could convert that time all the way down to milliseconds and sort data based on milliseconds. And then more importantly, what we was what was most satisfying while watching the conference is people, we could have it automatically adjust to people's time zones. So when you when you see it, something on your computer that displays your clock, it's actually looking at your computer's clock settings. So you can go into your time settings of like a Mac and get into the preferences and change time zones. And if you do that, you can refresh the page and you'll see the time in the time zone uh, that you set your computer at, right? So whatever clock your computer is set to, it would automatically adjust the time. And so, and it would always display like things like at the top GMT plus two. So that's basically that's, that's my where time Jim is right now. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Right, which, which so, I think was probably the feature that everybody loved the most. I mean, they love the design. Yeah. And there's so many aspects of it love. But there was like an outcry of support for this because obviously when you have an international conference with people across so many different time zones, that becomes really hard. And I think in previous OER conferences, what I remember is that sort of they used, they used their time zone and then there was a button you could click to go to like time.com where we convert it to whatever you wanted and you'd have to select you know, your particular time zone. And so every single session you're having to go, what time is that in my time? Where is this? It was just, it just worked, which, you know, it was amazing to see, like to not even have to think about it is incredible. And the whole idea that there's a GMT and a BST is still yeah. pissing me off. Like I'm still angry about that. Like I thought yeah. they were the same. They're not. No, B G G M uh, BST is GMT plus one. Yes. <laughs> And after you miss a couple of meetings because of those, you learn quickly. Um, one of the things that I wanted to talk about, um, and I think this really does involve everyone's work, uh, is kind of the how how the the videos were sort of held behind uh, start times, um, which was data that we obviously put into the headless WordPress dashboard. You know, to kind of say presentations are going to start at X time BST, right? So we did have to use that one sort of uh, standard time zone in the background uh, in order to have a, a proper schedule. But then once that was set up, Michael, you had a way to 
essentially play things at a certain time, you know, as they were kind of coming live on the schedule. And then I think there was so also some other work that was done with YouTube uh, directly to, you know, play things on time for the pre-recorded sessions. And I thought that just amplified the experience so much and did, you know, regardless of pre-recorded versus live, you had this countdown and it just sort of made you feel more immersed in the conference to be able to say, okay, this isn't a button that I can click an hour beforehand and just, oh, watch it whenever I want. You know, I'm joining the conference and it is starting at this time. Mm -hmm. And it makes it synchronous, right? Which is right. what you want with a, a conference like this is like, you want that synchronous aspect where everybody's consuming the same thing at the same time and can have a conversation about it. And yeah, I think originally our thought was that we would have the videos sort of play at the same time but obviously that gets questionable about like is it playing for everybody at the right time and then what we had found was that with youtube if it's a live video and someone plays the video ahead of time it just says this this video will start at x date at x time it just sits there right and it'll do a, a countdown or whatever like starting in 15 minutes or something same thing for a video premiere even if something's pre-recorded and you upload it if you say i want to premiere it at this time it treats it kind of like a live video in that, um, you know, it will, if somebody were to play it ahead of time, it would say this, this video starts at X date. Uh, and then, you know, I think it, two minutes beforehand, it would actually start counting down to it. And that allowed pretty much down to, you know, maybe a second or two here and there that everybody was seeing the video at the same time that it was live for everything, regardless of whether it was pre recorded or live. So that, and that was, was like awesome. a 12th hour discovery. <laughs> it was. Yeah. It was like that was Tuesday. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Was like, uh, yeah particularly oh, for, for the pre recorded stuff, right? Because yeah. for the live things, yeah. we knew what live was going to do and things right. were going to be live and that would be fine. But for the pre recorded stuff, it, begin, it gets to be a lot trickier to figure out. How do I make sure that every like nobody's going to hit play at the same time? And you kind of no. hope like, oh, we said it's at 10 o'clock. So people will go there at 10 o'clock. That's not going to happen. And it, I even tested uh, during the conference coming into something late and it would start where everybody right. else right. was in the video. Yeah. And I mean, that's that that's exactly that's what, what we wanted. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, that was very cool. I mean, because initially I had written it so that um, using time, it would, you could, you could have the time library say, Hey, what's time right now? Right. Right. And, and you would, you would check it against the time of the actual presentation and say like, Nope, that time's not here right now. So don't display the play button, just play a right. scheduled button. Mm -hmm. So, but I think once you discover this alternative, which was, wow, you can schedule pre-recorded material and it will re premiere live. And that's what it effectively is. It's, it's, it's actual just live to tape, right? So right. it's a live to tape that's broadcast at a particular time and everybody consumes it in that same broadcast time. Obviously, we haven't mentioned that ultimately this became this amazing archive, right? So this is a way that you can, it's a good interface to access all the presentations again, right? Because mm -hmm. they're all there. And that also uh, changed. Yeah, without that, having to do anything because they're all exactly. they're all so i like that downs i like that downs was like well we've all been doing this forever on youtube but it's like well actually there's something here where hundreds of videos were being live streamed and pre-recorded and they're an instant archive is that what you're talking about like right. no there's something to the web design and development of the actual data ahead of time that made that possible that's worth kind of a reflection on. Well, the, the experiential wrapper, I think is the thing that makes it different. Like, I mean, like that, that to me is an obvious statement. Like we can stream video always, like we've been able to do that for hundreds of years. You know, we just had to use horses or something. You know what I mean? Like, let's, I thought let's you were quoting it. an experiential rapper. Like, there's a rapper out there called Experiential <laughs> Rapper that you were about to quote. Yeah, <laughs> I, I may. I'm that may become my new stage name, Experiential <laughs> Rapper. Uh, but you know what I mean? Like, that, Downs is sad, and he wants everyone else to be sad, and that's that's what we go through every time with this, and that's all right. Um, but I mean, like that idea, like experience, like that to me, I think is the important thing here. Like you wanted to feel, you wanted to create these emotions and the, the combination is like the technology, much of which has existed, 
but to combine the things in a particular way with all these people being kind of guided both visually and and kind of in the moment through an experience like that's what makes it a thing like that that's how you design yeah. an experience so like it's i mean to say it already it. existed i mean come on it was yeah. so cool to see too in in the midst of talks like i remember uh, martha talking about in in the chat while her presentation was going on and she's like saying i'm never I, this is how i always want to present like it'd be so mm -hmm. awesome to have you know my presentation going on but then my ability to immediately field and interact with the audience in a way that's you know kind of this it's so it's so hard to do that live like if you're presenting yeah. Even to just watch the chat is very difficult when you're the person right. presenting because you're thinking of so many things. Mm -hmm. You've got your slides, you're trying to think, especially if you've got multiple people talking and all that, and then you forget, oh, I wanted to mention this link. And then like, you know, as opposed to being able to say like, oh yeah, here's that resource I'm talking about right now. And yeah, here's right. what we did. Yeah. And somebody asks a question, you can answer it while the presentation's still going on. Um, right. Yeah, I love it too. That was really cool. And you guys obviously did, I could tell, did a ton of, you know, basic post work. It was like kind of podcast edited post work where it's like, okay, we're just going to do these nice light edits here to keep the, con the, the conversation clear. That was all you, Jim. Thank God for you, Jim. Well, it's also the beauty of StreamYard, I think, too, which is what we're using now, but it does allow you to sort of produce on the fly and add in those bumpers in the beginning and end to kind of uh, bookend the, the session. You know, you can then add in logos and banners and StreamYard, um, you know, also does allow you to pull in live comments from YouTube as well. So you did have that interaction with the audience, even though the speakers themselves are sort of protected in <laughs> this little bubble. So uh, for me, that's calm. I'm not sure if that was, if the logo fell on anybody else, but. Um, I, I'm, I'm still waiting for the torrent drop of the six hour video conversation with Boone Gurgers where he goes it, off on Matt Mullenweg, you know? The gorgeous cut, yeah. <laughs> the gorgeous cut. I tell you, well, and and I think he left most. Like, let's be clear, most of what Jim left on the cutting floor was himself. I think <laughs> so, <laughs> cutting himself out of the videos. <laughs> it's true. With with like Mike and Tom, like Mike Wesh and Tom Woodward did one, and I it was like you know thirty something minutes, and when I cut myself out, it was twenty. <laughs> <laughs> so there you have it. But one of the ideas, so a couple of like fun ideas that I had talked with. I think Tom, I talked with you about it, wherever you are, there you are. And uh, I think I talked with Brian Lamb. Like I wanted to do, I had overbooked, so we had too many already, but I wanted to do a couple of fake sessions where I would have someone who I was chatting with, whatever, and then all of a sudden, like if they live, there would be a break in the TV, like someone had jammed the TV and came in. It was like, Tom, I think your character was going to say, like, if you're not using all open source, you know, hardware, you know, you're living a lie. And that was the, the information. It's like the opening of, uh, it, it, it's, it's like, yeah, when, what is it? Escape from New York when when the she's on the cockpit recorder saying, we have control. Exactly. <laughs> it's on it. the plane, your capitalist society is going down. <laughs> and I wanted to do like little break-ins, but then I was like, what if we did that to pre-existing talks? Like we came in and had people come in and break the kind of, but I, that's probably not ethical. But I got the same point. I do think it would be interesting to kind of to, to play a little bit more with it. Like I had fun with it. Even what we did, I had a blast. But now with all the data and the APIs, may, we could maybe do a randomizer, you know, that literally interjects things like that. If we have like a, you know, we have this archive of random clips. That would be Could so we insert fun. them over the top or even, you know, do like a pause JavaScript event on the thing and <laughs> kick it well, no, kick I mean, you we can over? Timestamps. Like the idea yeah. is like all the videos have timestamps. And if you go to the YouTube, I mean, every we go, we, the cool thing is we have one of the most important pieces of data is the unique YouTube ID for every video. So that's that's and that's bare alone. Right. So with you probably have to use the youtube api to do it so that because assigning timestamps um and opening the url isn't elegant but to do a, a bunch of switching 
where you it you because the YouTube API, I'm almost yeah. positive you can tell how long the video is, right? And so then you can generate a random timestamp within the length of the video and then remix the crap out of it. <clears throat> that would be actually, and you maybe could do like super cuts of all the times like people say something, you get a super cut in that really? of like the yeah. things people said, like open. Like all the different ways people said open in a context of what two or three words were before it and behind it would be hysterical. That's that's more work. Yeah, okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I do remember that one be like, now he's asking me to maybe pour foundation and I don't think I'm ready to do that. <laughs> I mean, the whole house has to sit on that thing. So maybe it's good if I get a professional for that part. <laughs> so let me ask you this, Michael, and this is kind of, this got into the, the fact that we came too late and asked too much, which you shouldn't be surprised of. What would have it taken to make it possible to switch between tracks? Oh, that was the thing, yeah, that was the one one thing that sick. I wish I'd had the time. It, it would have taken only another day, to be honest, another couple days, because I'm pretty sure. I mean, I'm not worried about like building the interactive tool to change channels. Like that would have taken some time to just sort out the best way to do that. Um, but the idea is the player. One of the things about the players, the player was not actually interacting with Tom's endpoint. Right? It was actually taking when the the constructed URL to the player just worked with old PHP get requests and it sent all the data in the URL. So the URL was this big sloppy string <coughs> of information. Like it had all the names of the speakers, it had the channel, it had the title. All that data was in the URL. And so it wasn't making, the player wasn't making requests to the endpoint. That being said, you easily could have had it making requests to the endpoint. And you would have to have some sort of Every time you you click change the channel, there's two events you have to track: changes of the channel, which is that's not too hard, but the other one was going to be when the event ends, right? And so, yeah, because because the events weren't yeah. timed so strictly, like in a TV studio, there would have to be some sort of query that happens, like so: hey, is it over? Five seconds later, hey, is it over? And that wouldn't necessarily be that much of a lift on the computer. If it was, it's not like you're making that request every like 10 milliseconds or something like that. You just make it every like three or four or five seconds. And so if it was over, it would automatically just say like, oh, that one's done. Then let's play the next one. And then, and it would probably require getting into the YouTube API. That would be even the better way to do it. So if something ends, it would automatically like switch to the next one. Yeah. But I don't know. I mean, it definitely would have been possible. It would have been cool to sort out how to solve it. Right? I think it's to be continued. Yeah. I do want to revisit some of this. Was I think it's a cool enough platform that you guys created that we could revisit it and have a little fun with it. Not only with some of the stuff you're talking about remixing, but even like another event, taking what you've built on that foundation, because I do think it's yeah. foundational and actually like, you know, giving you the time and energy to put some stuff on top of it. So I'm, I'm very interested in that person. I also think it, it could have been cool. One of the things I found myself wanting throughout those two days was a way to come to the site and see, okay, take me to what's playing live right now right. versus, you know, having to navigate times and, and kind of sift through the site a little bit more, which again, not a huge deal because the time converting piece was so helpful, but being able to say, okay, you know, what's playing live in domains right now, you know, what's playing live in OER one or two, and just kind of highlighting that section through the TV guide yeah. or something, um, yeah. you know, or fading out other pieces, like just I, some sort I of visual think that, I think you could have had the, the guide as the guide, and then the TV is the TV and three channels to change between. And that TV is always on with the various chats. Like you could actually have the guide and the TV. And so, yeah. and in some ways, you know, the, the discord would be like the living room furniture that you're hanging yeah. out chatting in. But like, those are the two, the, and the guide is, and the TV. That is kind of a cool idea. Cause I think that was one of the, and that's something I could obviously argue I think on either side of, because I sort of liked that you had to go in a separate window 
for the presentation that you wanted to watch and you know and then you kind of navigated back to find the next one but to automate some of that also to kind of say you know let's just switch I, the channel but i fun. wanted more eyeballs like i wanted to get someone in the stream and then not feel like they could leave <laughs> like i really wanted to trap them like they would watch and then they would see a commercial and then they would get a bumper and then the next thing would start and then they would be like oh okay because i feel like the way in which the web is designed, we're not doing that well enough with Facebook and Instagram. We need to do it more and better. Screen time have screen time has never been higher. I, I think I would argue. I mean, no, I think what what Jim's getting at is this more it's this even more passive experience right. than we, are, you know, which is like you 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 you're making even you're you're just interacting not at all. At a certain point, you're just like ah. Just take me on a ride. Yeah, I just like this. I like this channel. I want to be here. I don't have to touch anything, you know. And I'll be here for a while. That's cool. You know, it's funny because exactly. I, I I have this thing where I'm coding at night and doing stuff. I go back to watch broadcast television, and there's this network called MeTV. And starting at 11:30, Perry Mason comes on. Right, and I I love Perry Mason. It's just a great classic legal thriller where someone always cops to the murder, which is the best. Right, never would happen in real world. But there's all the commercials still there, and there are all these commercials for people that are like my age and older. Which you know, it's like oh crap, if I'm hitting the demographic. Um, and then the Twilight Zone comes on. And then like another episode, it's just amazing to just be like, ah, oh, this is fine. Let me just watch this for a while, exactly. you know, and I'll right. deal with the commercials. They're legalizing <laughs> marijuana, <laughs> God, like network television. Like this is all right. It's not all bad. <laughs> well, I think we did it again. We did oh, it again. <laughs> oh, no. I won't, I won't. But, I, any other last points? I think we kind of we, we covered it pretty well and even linked towards future steps. But anything else around OER? Yes, Tom. I think my, my comment is like the reason I think interesting things keep happening with this particular group of people maybe is <laughs> because we try and do things that are interesting anyway. You know what I mean? Like I feel like if you always say like, We'll do that when we have enough time. Let's just do the standard thing again. I mean, then that you're just in that loop for forever. If you don't throw it out there and be like, well, come hell or high water, this better work, um, then I think things don't get done. And if you don't have interesting goals to begin with, things never change for you. So, I mean, like, I, I think there's something to be said there, and you see it in lots of things. Um, so, I mean, like, I don't think that can be overstated. Yeah. And I know, like, you know, when Jim proposed the idea early on, I mean, it, like, I forget what he said, but he had said like a few words and I immediately knew where he was going to go with this headless WordPress TV guide, all this stuff. Like I knew his whole vision, like right from the get go and that he was going to pull in you and you and uh, Michael. And I was, I was just sort of like, Yes, but like I, I was like I was I was the butt person. Like I was the butt of I had and, and, I had to bring in the other ed tech survivalist. That's yeah. what I had to do. Because we gotta was, do this. And mostly just because I was like, okay, but we have like three, four weeks left before the conference begins. <laughs> And yeah. uh, I didn't want to pull other people in and be like, hey, we've got this really awesome idea and we've got like three weeks to build it. Um, right. But I'm glad we did. And I'm glad that you all were game for it, for sure. Yeah, so, the, har the most harrowing part ultimately was like, so, hey, yeah, the data needs to be in there. I need the real data. Yeah. <laughs> and that was also super challenging because you know, we had, it was sort of conceptual for the longest time and you couldn't have the site, the display site without the content to go there. And we yeah. didn't have the content until, you know, a very quick, it, it was very, very soon before the conference, before that data actually came in, because we were still working with the speakers and going through edits and things, which I'm sure the alt team, alt team can speak um, 
more intelligently about but you know it was sort of it was like building the ship as we were sailing it you know yeah. and we really didn't get those final pieces until the end and then of course you're training the speakers and getting them sort of acclimated in the system and then they would make changes to their presentation which of course made changes for how we were displaying it and so i needed you know more fields from tom and we had to rethink things with michael and so it just there was definitely a few days towards the end where it was like, can you just do this? Oh, and this and this also. Um, I was it's always disappointed it's, though. It was so smooth because I wanted <laughs> to like see things go bad and be like these irresponsible assholes ruined our conference. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is always uh, Jim. Jim's philosophy is always just compliment the shit out of them and then ask for a bunch of crap. Like, it's like, <laughs> oh my god, you're so great! This is amazing. But I do this. How do you think reclaim hosting was built? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh my gosh. Oh, no. Jim, you're what so wonderful, day. Lord. I love you, but I need this and this and this. And this. <laughs> <laughs> yes, some of those asks early on were like, "Can this website like solve world hunger?" And say we, say we like spin a server up and offer it up to people with hosting. <laughs> it was it was a cool project though, and I, I mean, it I, kind of going back to Tom's oh, point, great. I think like the the tools that we used were not. It's nothing new. It's just putting them together in such a way that made for a really elegant experience. And for folks that did kind of want an overview of the tools that we use, that was probably kind of glazed over and we could have covered that more in the beginning of this uh, session, but we had, you know, Tim, you did a lot of work in the beginning also with single sign-on to kind of protect yeah. the site for just the, the participants, the folks registered in the conference. And now I believe it is available for everyone to see, but that was a really important piece as well to know that, okay, the folks logging in and interacting, seeing the Discord chat and the YouTube chats and all of that, it was just the audience of the conference, right? And yeah. then we had, um, you know, StreamYard was how we were uh, scheduling out these presentations for live speakers. And StreamYard had uh, unique URLs that then led to unique YouTube IDs. And that's how we were pulling in everything into the headless site. Um, and then the really important distinguish, distinguishing factor with the chats, of course, uh, would be the YouTube chats were how we were uh, interacting for live presentations and Discord became the chat for pre-recorded presentations. So there was that distinction, but of course for participants, we really wanted, we didn't wanna have to explain that or you know, say to folks, this is StreamYard and YouTube and over here, this is Discord and here's where you go for this one, but over here, you have to go over here. You know, we just wanted it to seamlessly embed across the board. And so that's kind of where the conference display site, I think really took shape and became the home base. And that's kind of how we referred to it in a lot of the support resources is regardless of your technical experience, all you need to do is log in with your, you know, your registrant credentials and you'll see everything you need to see. And if you want more experience, if you want to engage more, you know, we do have this discord space over here that you can install if you want, you know, but Twitter's still going to work, you know, YouTube's still going to work. It's all just going to be embedded right there. So I think just like that seamless mesh is, is one of my favorite parts. I agree. And I really loved the, the idea of the, the guide being the visual presence of it. Like all those other pieces, YouTube worked beautifully, Discord worked beautifully, StreamYard worked beautifully, but like no one really needed to understand that as the icon, as well as the player. Like that could be us. And I think that could only be done by us. And I love that we did it because I feel like it's so quick to offload the SCAD or offload these other things. And you just have this cookie cutter experience. Whereas I feel like when people came to, the website and their first experience of it was like, wow, that's pretty crazy. Whether they got the reference or not, I do think it was different. And I want to actually print out on paper, high grade paper, the actual thing with the OER guide thing and kind of create like a framed thing to put on the I love me wall. 
<laughs> like I want that because I think it's such a beautiful like thing. Like I think it stood my joke with Lauren as we were preparing for this was like, you know, even if the conference doesn't work, it's going to look good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I will say jokes aside, the artwork, you know, is probably some of the best, some of my favorite stuff that Brian has ever done. And maybe yeah. that, you know, deserves its own conversation and own, own podcast because his bumpers were just dream worthy. You know, they were so cool. Um, and just, all the different versions of the logos, the media badges, you know, just so many different mediums and elements that kind of came together to make this metaphor happen. And um, I even still have my little tote bag back here. Uh, but it's- Yeah, I want my swag, by the way. I need some OERX domains television stickers. That's fine, yeah. Yeah, I, I have to send, I should send it to everybody and I will. I actually also wanna, oh, I gotta talk to Tim because he's gonna say no, but because <laughs> that's how he is. But I actually wouldn't mind getting some momentum. I want to see if someone could print out the guide. And if we can oh, frame I can design it, it for stuff. layout. That's not hard. If you could do that, let me know. Because then you could do all the work. <laughs> and so it's not really like a present. <laughs> well, I mean, here's yeah. the thing. Do you want to print it out so it's actually like a foldable TV guide? Or I want it to you... be framed. So you want, you just want, you want like the poster. pages. Yeah. Yeah, the poster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you, that's no problem. If you could have that by next Friday, that'd be yeah. amazing. Here's the situation. Stay yeah. to Italy. There's, yeah. One thing. Right. Great work, Michael. Big fan. Big fan. I do love it. But yeah, I read all your tweets. <laughs> <laughs> you guys were amazing though. I mean, I really had a blast working with you. I'm glad it worked out so well. I don't think anyone I don't think there were any freakouts. I think we got along pretty cleanly and it was fun and it was awesome. So big fan, literally. Anything else? Are we done here? Is this thing over? Are we done? <laughs> nom nom nom.